John chapter number 5. We'll begin reading verse number 20. The <clears throat> Bible says, For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. For as the Father, father raises up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. Now, in these verses, Jesus, talking of the Father and speaking of himself, goes into, first, the recognition. If we honor the Son, we honor the one that sent the Son. Well, the Son and the Father being one, we honor the Son, we honor the Father. So, when we honor Christ, we doubly honor God Himself in two different ways. But then because in both ways we honor both the Father and the Son, by honoring Christ, we actually give God, if you do the math, about four times the glory what are you saying that's just the way that I think about things sometimes but it's always right to do what the son because he had learned of the father instructed us to do why do you think that in the Old Testament law God told the Hebrews that in order for something to be taken as fact they had to have two or three witnesses well here Jesus is saying, everything that I tell you, I've learned to the Father. What's that? Two witnesses. Then later on, you'll find that there's one that bears witness to everything that the Father and Son does. Who's that? The Spirit. And the witness of two of the three, Jesus is saying, God's witnessed it three times that this is what we ought to do. It was more than just what Christ said. It was what God had agreed upon between God himself. Just another thought that Jordan has. But we get into the verses. Father loved the Son. Son loved us. Likewise, recipients of love, it's very easy for us to reciprocate love. If we have known true love, then it is easy to love the one that showed that love to us. But also, part of that new creature that he made, it goes against the Spirit. It goes against that desire in our hearts for us not to love people. It's one of the testaments of the house of God that we have love one for another. But it's also a testament in the community because Christ was the friend of publicans and sinners. In fact, he didn't call them servants he didn't call them publicans he didn't call them sinners what did he call them he called them friend it's easy if you're in the will of God doing your best to live being guided by the spirit it's easy to love people where do you think that love started from well the father loved the son but the son loved us so much that he and the father and the spirit had a meeting one day in the alpha time and Christ said I'm going to go and die for their sins and they were agreed upon it why because as much as the father loved the son God loved you and he loved you enough to lay down his own life so when it says in verse number 20 for the father loveth the son we can't comprehend that love that God the father has for God the son but to truly wrap your head around how much the son and the father loved us that they would forsake that love and break that bond so that we could be a part of the family of God that blow your mind but then it goes on to say that the father loved the son because he loved the son he kept nothing from the son he showed him all things we can go over to John chapter number one every step of the way through creation every step of the way from the alpha time the father and the son were there together the Spirit bore witness to it all. And without nothing, or without Christ, was nothing made. We know that He had all power. Just as the Father had all power. That's the point that Jesus is trying to make here. 
And then, Jesus goes on to say, he showed him all things. And he's speaking of himself, he says, he's going to show you greater works than these. Through who? Through the Son. He says, the Father has taught me all. He shows me all. I know all, so that by what I'm about ready to show y'all, when? Throughout the rest of his earthly ministry, you would see greater things than these and know that Christ was the Son of God. We see the proof. He says, I am my Father's Son, but there have been a lot of people come through that claim that they know God, claim to be a child of God. There are those in Israel's past that said that they knew God, but they knew not God. And Christ said, not just, you know, temporary miracles, not just fading prophecies. He says, you're going to see the very power of God revealed so that you know that I am who I say I am. Then he goes on to give an example. Verse number 21, For as the Father raiseth up the dead and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. How many times did Jesus raise someone from the dead said whom he will now the father he says is the one that raiseth up the dead one day God's going to send out a call first there's going to be a shout with a voice or with a trump with the voice of an archangel and those that are dead in Christ will be all coming up then those that are alive, alive and remain they're going to be called up too and quickly changed but then one day God the father God the son in heaven there's going to be a call and anyone that has ever lived outside of the salvation of God, they're going to be called up. There's coming a day that everyone that has ever lived is going to be quickened by God to stand before Him in judgment. So when He says that the Father raiseth up the dead, that's not just plural, that's also all-encompassing. There's one day God's calling up all those that have died. It's just a fact, and because... God is never past. He's in, he's in the past. He's in the, but he's always in the present. Jesus, he raises up the dead. Because he will do it one day doesn't mean that he can't do it right now. He's the Father that raises up the dead. But then it says, then the Son quickeneth whom he will. You know what that's saying? They didn't understand it at this point, John chapter number 5. But what he's saying is, because the Father has showed me how to raise the dead unto life, once the payment is made for sin, he's saying, I have the right to offer it to whomever I want to offer it to. What he's saying is, if I offer something, you cannot revoke my offer because you don't think that they're worthy of it. He says, the Son quickeneth whom he will. He doesn't quickeneth who the popular choice is. He doesn't quicken or raise from death unto life those that he thinks will be most useful, those that he thinks are most deserving. No, those that he has favor on is what he's saying. And because the Son was the one that was entrusted by the Father with the ability to raise from death unto life, when it comes to those that were in dead and trespasses to sin, if the Son calls your name, the only thing that can keep you from being saved is your own lack of faith. No man, no power of hell, no power in heaven can revoke an offer of salvation from the Son. God Himself couldn't revoke it because He promised that whosoever will may come. He exalted His Word above His own name. Therefore, God, who cannot lie, when he said that the Son quickeneth whom he will, if the Holy Ghost draws you, if the Son extends the invitation, the only thing that can keep you from getting saved is yourself. He removed all the barriers so that whom the Son will be saved can be saved. That's the kind of love that he had for us. But then, goes on to say, verse number 22, For the Father judgeth no man. The Father 
will not judge at the judgment seat of Christ. Will not judge at the great white throne of judgment. You go and study the book of Revelation, the one that was worthy to open the seven seals of the book. Who was that? Christ. You go and study out those that die without knowing the Lord. Those nations that will be judged according to how they treated Jesus Christ. That judgment will be done by the Son. God set His standard, God the Father, set His standard in the law. And when the Son came and fulfilled the law, the Son was given by the Father the right to judge according to the law because He fulfilled it. Does that mean that the Father cannot judge? Oh no, He's got judgment. And He has wrath. Then it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. It's not that the Father cannot, the Father chose to give judgment to the Son. Because He proved and met the standard was acceptable in the eyes of God, the Father. That's why the sin offering for our sins on Calvary was accepted. Because He was the Lamb without spot and without blemish. He was approved and certified by the Father. That's why it had to be Christ, because no other blood would have been acceptable in the eyes of the Father. So then we get into the second half of verse number 22. The Father judges them, but hath committed all judgment under the Son. That word committed means given. Didn't mean that the Son stripped it from the Father. Oh no, the Father entrusted it. The Father freely gave. The Father willed it to happen. And what do we know about Christ from His earthly ministry? He did the will of the Father. Because the Father wished for Him to have all judgment committed unto Him, the Son accepted the judgment. What are you saying? God's got a method and everything. And can you imagine man trying to figure all this out if Jesus Himself didn't tell what happened between the Father and the Son? Never would have happened. But there's a point to why Christ is outlining this. One, verse number 23, because those in our Bible physically saw Christ, those that see Him by faith and receive salvation, they understand that Christ, being the Son, the promised one, the perfect one, the, I don't know how you make propitiation into a, noun but the propitiate one I don't know the one that paid our propitiation for us because he was given all judgment when he judged to save us when we responded we gave glory to the father when we by faith agree to live by his judgment what he says yea and when he says nay we by faith trust Him and live and do our best to live in accordance with His Spirit hand in hand with Him as we walk along the way we give glory to the Father. But see the Father verse number 22 hath committed all judgment unto the Son verse number 23 that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. The Father is worthy and is Deserving of our praise and honor as He is. I mean, He's still God. The Father exalted the Son so highly that the Father would rather forsake His own glory so that the Son would receive more glory. That's how perfect the Father thought the Son was. That He said His name should be above mine, but they have the same name. By the way, it's Jehovah. But the Father says, I will take a step back so that the Son may be even more glorified and honored. Look at verse number 23. That all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. By honoring the Son, the Father still receives glory. 
but he says, as they honor the Father. That's one of the things that they tried to indict Jesus on, that he made himself equal with God. Well, no, no, he was God, and the Father and the Son, according to verse number 23, are equal. Up until this point in your Bible, in the Old Testament, they didn't know about the Father and the Son. They knew about the Father, and they knew about the Spirit of God. In fact, we could find Jesus in the Old Testament, the Spirit of the Lord. But they didn't understand that there was three separate entities. They knew him as Jehovah, and they worshipped him as holy. And when Israel was following after God, God would send men with either an open vision, meaning that there was something that the Lord needed to tell Israel, direct them, gave a message to a prophet, or to a high priest, or sometimes to a king. And then other times they were entrusted with the law that they just live as God gave it to them. That they do their best to be obedient. There was no open vision as the Old Testament would say. But they did not have a personal, intimate relationship with God. Some people got closer than others. The Bible says that Moses talked to God as a friend, face to face. They knew about God's judgment. They knew about God's law. They knew about obedience, but they knew very little about grace. Noah knew about grace. Abraham knew about grace. But little by little, Israel began to corrupt the law of God from seeing grace into seeing commandment. Then they thought that the commandments were what made them righteous in the eyes of God. That's what the Pharisees taught in Jesus' day. How far they had gotten away from what God originally delivered to the children of Israel in the wilderness. The instruction and the law. But all of it was pointing to one day he would send the perfect one. They didn't know about how personal God wanted to become with them. But when he came, God said, he gets as much glory and as much honor as the Father. Well, how much glory and honor does the Father get? Oh. So how much glory and honor is the Son worthy of? Oh. And he even says, if, because we being men, we can only glorify one thing at one time. I've got one tongue. Although sometimes I think that I could talk fast enough that I might be able to say two different things at once. But we cannot glorify in the same second the Father and the Son at the same time. But the Father said those that honor the Son do honor the Father. He says I'd rather you give Him glory because I'll still get glory because I'm the Father and He's the Son. But the name that was given above any other name, Jesus the one that was he even said and I if I be lifted up will draw all men unto him he died on the cross but he was suspended between heaven and earth so that men had to look at the son of God and if we exalt his name today and give him honor and glory the father's fine with it because the father still gets glory but he says the preeminent one the one that should receive the attention because of what he did how he did it and how it pleased the Father is Christ. Then it goes on to say in verse number 24, that he that heareth the word and believe on him that sent me hath everlasting life. What's, what's that verse? You go on and continue reading it. Jesus says, I will that all that hear. Well, who did he send his disciples to? All. Who did he commission the church to go to? All. He's saying the son that can quicken whom he wants to chooses that all can be quickened because I love all but we're not going to teach on most of that today. thought that I want to draw your attention to back in verse number 22 the father judges no man but hath committed all judgment unto the son now notice it doesn't say judgment for sin it doesn't say judgment over the children of God doesn't say judgment of heretics or blasphemers or those that uh, worship idols or uh, paganistic gods, not the heathens. There's all judgment. We've went over this a few weeks ago and then the preacher preached on it that Sunday morning too. What does the word all mean? All. All judgment. 
Every last bit of it, nothing withheld. I mean, <laughs> the New Testament talks about him being our prophet, our priest, and our king. Well, who judged whether or not Israel was following after the Lord once a vision was sent? The prophet. Anybody remember Samuel went down and rebuked Saul for not slaying the animals and the oxen and the bleeding of the sheep, and then he slew the king and then the false prophets? Prophet. Then there was the priest who judged whether or not the sacrifice had been done according to what thus saith the Lord, the high priest. Because he had to make sure everything was done right before he went into the holies of holies or his life would have been required of him. He was entrusted with the judgment of the sacrifice. And then who was entrusted with the judgment? I mean, Solomon asked for the wisdom to judge God's people righteously. Their everyday deeds, their overall, what they were doing in their expansions and their trades and their relations with other countries were they doing as what God would have entrusted or envisioned the people of God doing that was the king well Christ being all three of those what's that mean he's got all judgment in every facet not just of sin judgment overall the father proved that he believed he was perfect he knew he was perfect before he sent him. He was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. But him being perfect, the Father entrusted all judgment. Because let's go back just for a second. John chapter number 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Capital W. Jesus was the Word made flesh. So the one that was given judgment was the very Word of God. What does that mean? He was the standard. He was the law. What man heard was all those 600 and something laws in the Old Testament that were given unto Israel. You know what the Father was really saying? Be as my son. Be the Word. That's my standard. So why wouldn't the one who met those ex all those expectations, fulfilled them and then went far beyond it. Why wouldn't he be the one whether or not to judge if what in front of him was acceptable under the Father? Because he knew what was acceptable under the Father because he is that thing that is accepted. That's why we have to be in him and him to be in us in order for us to be acceptable unto God. He didn't say that we were the vine. No, we're just the branch that was grafted into the vine. Because the Father was happy with the vine but because now the branch is a part of the vine, that means the vine's grown into him, and the branch has grown into the vine, and they've become one. We were grafted in. That means we weren't apart, but he made us apart until they were one. So of course he has all judgment. But when people think about the judgment of God, we think of judgment for sin. We think about judgment of whether or not what we do in the future is according to his will or not according to his will that he would judge that we think that the judgment is a far off thing but we'll stand before the judgment seat one day yeah but he still judges today all judgment everything so then in that vein we can go back to Matthew chapter number 5 or no I'm sorry chapter number 7 Sermon on the Mount. We get into, I'm not going to bring up the you know, post traumatic stress of us having to take like nine months to, in order to get through it. But when we thought on it back then, judge not lest ye be judged. When Christ said that, he said, You people, in, in context, he was talking to the Israelites, he's saying, Earthen people. Do not judge. You judge not. Lest you be judged. And then he goes on to say that you would be judged with the measure of judgment that you meted out. He's saying if you offer your judgment, you will be held to the same standard. But he does not say, do not live by judgment. He's saying don't offer your interpretation of what is right and wrong. How many times do we see in the Bible, lean not on your own understanding? 
or lean not under your own understanding. That the intellect or the wisdom of man, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of truth. If we could have figured out what was right and wrong and how to be right without being wrong, Christ wouldn't have had to come. If we were so infallible, God would have not had to have given the law to teach us what the difference between right and wrong was. Jesus is saying, don't use your standard of what's right and wrong when he says, judge not. Because then you're going to be held to your own standard. But by implication, what he's telling them is, don't use your judgment. Live by the judgment of God. You do not need to indict others on whether or not they're right with God. All judgments have been given to the Son. That's not up to us. We just have to embrace the judgment that was already delivered. That man wasn't enough, but Christ was. Very few people live with that mindset. What's going around or going on around us may not be right in the eyes of God, but it's my job not to judge or to rebuke what's going on in the world it's my job to live as a light I'm supposed to be different I'm supposed to be a pilgrim in a strange land I'm supposed to be an ambassador for a kingdom that everyone else may have not seen but I'm supposed to be a representative of where I come from he says judge not lest ye be judged according to your own standard we're all going to be judged but he's saying you may be judged worse than others when you stand before God because God may have to use your own standards against you because you voiced them. I wonder, Brother Brian, when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, which is from the time that we got saved until the time that he either raptures us out or until we go on to heaven, how Christ is going to say, here's the standard that I wanted you to live to. And we're going to have to confess and face the fact that I didn't live up to his standard and all the times that I failed him but then over here he's going to say and here's all the standards that you held everybody else to that you didn't keep yourself why because I judged according to my intellect what I thought was right what I expected others to do and by implication if I think it's good for the goose, it should be good for the gander and me too. <coughs> People's lives would be so much simpler if we lived according to God's judgment rather than our own judgment. When he says all judgments have been given unto Christ, that means it doesn't matter whether you think it's right or wrong out in the world, the judgment of Christ was that we were supposed to be a light unto him. That we were supposed to be the Mediary between them learning about Christ and where they are right now. Because it's God's will that men be used to win other men. That people be used to win other people. How can they do that if we, in our mind, have judged them into the point that they're not worthy to hear? Well, neither were you. But see, the Son raiseth whom He will. And He willed that you hear it just like he willed that they hear it because in his judgment all need to hear the story and in the father's judgment he says all need to hear the story so that all can give glory to the one that deserves the most glory and by giving him glory the father gets glory we rob God of glory when we use our own judgment what we're saying is we know better than Christ we'll get back to that here in a second but then when it comes to the judgment not just of those that we're supposed to go to or how we're supposed to live our life he has all judgment he's in charge of what goes on in the world you don't believe me you can go read the book of Job where the devil said that he couldn't touch Job because God hedged him in too good you don't believe me go and look at when the devil tempted Christ three times in the wilderness Jesus didn't bring a railing accusation against him. What did he use? The word of God. The judgment that had already been rendered. Lucifer knew he couldn't stand up to the judgment. That's why he was kicked out of heaven. He was cast out with a third of the angels because they rebelled against the judgment of God. 
If it was good enough back then, it's still good enough now. Christ said, this is stronger than anything in the world. The gates of hell cannot prevail against the church of the living God. That Him being in us makes us more than conquerors through Christ. Everything about the Christian life that we are taught in the New Testament is equipping us with spiritual and heavenly things that the world cannot defeat. Now they can rob us of a few things, our joy, our passion, our commitment. Sometimes they can even rob you of your sanity. They can rob you of your peace. They can rob you of a lot, but if we embrace and use the tools that Christ envisioned us to have, they cannot defeat us. By His judgment, He said, you know, what did the Apostle Paul say? Shield of faith would quench the fiery darts of the devil. He says, what I've given you is good enough. Because it came from Him. And He being perfect gave us all things. In fact, Jesus said that those things that the Father had showed to Him, He would show to us because we were His friends and not servants. He said He without nothing from us. What's that mean? Everything that Christ had at His disposal, we now have at our disposal through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I may not be able to wield it. I may not be able to handle it the proper way, but He can. He asked me to do what I can do, and by His judgment... When I meet His standard, which is what? Obedience. Obedience is greater than sacrifice. When I meet the standard of obedience and faith, what does He do? He steps in and does what I cannot do for myself. But if by my judgment I think I'm not going to do it that way, I'm going to do it a different way, I've taken off His equipment, I've put on my own, it's going to fail me. Because all judgment on what goes on in the world, if Christ says you can't touch Him, nothing can touch Him. If he says, I want that water to part and he's going to cross on dry ground, it's going to happen. It may happen like it did at the Red Sea where he causes a great strong wind to blow. Or may cause, or cause it to happen like it did at the River Jordan where they had to commit their feet to the water first before it parted. But however he wants it to happen, it'll happen that way. But see, even the things that happen that we don't agree with, are by the design and the judgment of Christ. Wonder how much we thought about that when so many of us were upset on who won the election in November. By voicing our displeasure with it, I find in the Bible that no man comes to power unless God ordains it, raises him to power. And because he entrusted the power, you know, gave the power to him, he can take it away whenever he wants to. I find that he does all things well. I find that his ways are above our ways. I wonder how many people came in and couldn't worship at church for however long because in their heart they were still grieved over who won the election. Or grieved because somebody did this that they didn't like. Or somebody gave this interview on TV. I'm a whole lot happier now that I don't watch all that junk. And I'm a whole lot happier not listening to pundits who want to say what they think is right I know what's right not because I was smart enough to figure it out but because the spirit was given to lead and guide me into all truth I know what's right and wrong because he's taught me what's right and wrong when I encounter something that I don't know what's going on he will show me the way the truth and the life because he shows me himself and as long as I stay in here as long as I keep my eyes on him I know what looks like him and what doesn't look like him I know what sounds like him and what doesn't sound like him. I know what gives glory unto him and what robs him of glory. And it's not real hard in those situations. Well, if it's of God, and if it's not of God, it's real easy to follow after him. Because that's the devil is all about shroud and secrecy and deception. Christ came and made himself plain for all to see. He's the same way spiritually as we walk after Him. He makes Himself plain. He said, take up our cross and follow Him. How could we follow Him if He was hidden from us? No. He's always right here. Whenever I call for Him, 
so long as there's no iniquity between me and him, my plea goes directly to his ear. Nothing hinders it. He removed all barriers between us because of his judgment. He judged that he could be the kinsman redeemer, not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles. And what's that mean? We were in the family just like anybody else was in the family. There's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, the epistles tell us. You know what that means? I'm just as much in as everybody else is. Anybody else that ever got saved from when he died on Calvary, because he says that he went down to Abraham's bosom and led captivity captive, first person got saved didn't get saved until after he died on the cross. There were some under God's protection, but they didn't have the salvation. But nobody ever since he shed his blood has gotten in better than me. Nothing was withheld from me that was given to them. What are we saying? By his judgment, all things work to his design. When we take issue with it, we rob God of his glory. When God's people walk around talking about how bad things are in the world, well, yeah, they're bad in the world because God's not in the world. The world is the world. The world would be a whole lot less bad if we, as the church, went out and showed the light of God a little bit more. If we personally took on the responsibility that because of the judgment of God, He judged that I was worthy to take the name of His Son to a lost and dying world, if we truly embrace that responsibility, maybe the world would look a little bit different. If we understood that a thrice holy God judged that you were enough, because of what His Son did and because of what His Son put into you, you were enough that you could go and witness and tell somebody else about the darling Son of God. That He would equip you to do what Christ Himself did. The first person that ever testified about who Jesus was and how, glorified, or how glorious He was and how great He would be was God through the Old Testament through pictures and types and examples of what one day the perfect son would be. Then when he came, he didn't entrust an angel, didn't entrust, you know, John the Baptist, although John the Baptist, greatest man ever born of a woman, according to Jesus. John the Baptist, great preacher. Right? Great witness. But when Christ came, who did the talking about who Christ was? Christ John the Baptist said, there's one coming. He prepared the way. But when Christ came, John the Baptist took a step back. He said, I'm not worthy to latch his shoes. Those afterwards, after he went back up into heaven, what did they testify of? What Jesus had said and what he had done. They added to and they took not away. They testified of what the Son was so that we would believe that he was who he said he was. All the epistles are written so that we be more like Christ. That we have a better understanding of who the Son of God was so that we can live according to his standard. Which is what? That we obey, that we follow, and he would robe us in his righteousness. It was his judgment that we could be enough to go tell somebody who had never heard about Christ, who had no understanding of the things of God, that we could go and be a witness. That we could live in a way that showed them they truly believe what they say they believe. That we could go and have our feet shod with the preparation of peace. That we could have our loin skirt, that we could have our breastplate of righteousness on, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, the sword... But truly, when he says go, what's he saying? He says, go and I'll be with you. He says, I'm enough to handle everything else, but in my judgment, I want you to go. I judge that you are enough. That you are good enough. So long as you let the Spirit do that work of the new creature inside of you. I couldn't go as my old self. Never would have been enough. I can't go as my new self on my own. Never going to be enough. But I can by faith just believe, well, Lord, you made me into a new creature. And I don't know all that you want to make me into. 
And really, I don't know all that you're making me into right now. All that you're doing, I don't know how it's going to play out. What I'm going to look like. But I do know what I used to be, and you've made me into something different than that. So I'll just by faith keep doing what you instruct me to do. You say, well, what do we tell the world? We tell what Jesus did for us. You know what the apostles talked about? What Christ did for them. What Christ did for other people. How he did what nobody else could do. It's not rocket science. But what we don't understand is that every day the things that we don't think about God ordaining and God's judgment that the Son decided or judged that's the way that it ought to be. When we do other than what God would have us to do, what we're saying is Christ isn't good enough. To the Holy Ghost who bears witness of the Son who was in the beginning. He moved on the face of the waters, Genesis tells us. He was on earth long before anybody else. And you know what the Spirit has always said throughout all of history? He's worthy. He's worthy. The Spirit does not testify or speak of Himself. Who does He speak of? The Son. When the Spirit was made manifest in the Old Testament to demonstrate the power of God, you know what it said? God is God. Do you know what the Spirit tells you? If we were to really break it down, He's told me a whole lot over the years. But you know everything that He's told me? Jesus was good enough. Now sometimes that tells me how ungood enough I am. How unworthy I am. How no good, down low, rotten I am. But then He also comes by and whispers and says, but He's good enough. There are some days that He says His judgment has never failed, just keep trusting in it. What's he saying? Jesus is good enough. When it comes to all the pains, all the aches, all the hurt in life, you know what the Spirit tells me? Christ is good enough to heal that. He's good enough to take away that pain if you let Him. It's hard to embrace His judgment sometimes. It hurts to embrace judgment sometimes. But whatever we forsake for His name and for His cause, He will replace. His judgment was that if man loves me, or loves father or mother, son or daughter more than me, he's not worthy of them. That's a hard truth to embrace. It's a hard judgment to apply to your life. But if we are willing to forsake or to move others in our life back so that he has the preeminence, he will reward it. It's not always easy, but he's strong enough that if I surrender to it, he will allow it to happen. But all those things every day that we think just happen. It happened because Jesus judged that it should happen. By him and through him do all things consist. Not one gust of wind blows that messes your hair up that he didn't will to blow. Not one pebble is in the parking lot unless he willed it to be there. Right? The nail that we run over out in the middle of the road, even though we're driving down a road that hadn't had construction in about 12 years, and we wonder where the nail came from, how it got there, and why four of them were right there in the same spot. They were there because Christ willed it to be there. All the trials that enter our life are ordained by God. All the hardships that enter our life, so long as we're in the will of God, they're ordained by God. How hypocritical is it to say, well, yes, I accept the judgment of Christ of how I should live my life, but then we don't accept the judgment of what happens to us in life. And let me just say a caveat. If you're not living according to the will of God, chastisement will come, but some things that come your way aren't because God wanted it to, but it's because you're reaping what you're sowing. But then again, that is the will of God, because be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. That's the way he intended it to be. Whatever you put in the ground, you got to deal with what's coming up out of it. Why is it that way? Because God wanted it that way. He judged that that was the way things should be. 
So when we shirk His judgment, when we bucket His judgment, when we question His judgment, and that question is in, Lord, why'd that happen? I've thought that a bunch, but you know what the Spirit tells me? Because God's up to something. All right, good enough for me. You say, yeah, but it's going to be hard to keep going. Yeah, but God's up to something. I want to find out what it is. I want to be a part of it if it'll let me. You say, what? All these judgments, what? how do we know to embrace? Just walk by faith. But then ask God for enough discernment to show it to you, to reveal it to you, to teach you how to discern that when something bad happens, hey, when mess my hair up? Not the end of the world. You know what would be the end of my testimony? Getting in a big hussy all over, you know, a big fit because my hair's now messed up because the wind was blowing yesterday. You know what could ruin your testimony? Walking out in your backyard, kicking and screaming and throwing sticks around that the wind knocked down because of the storm. You know what won't ruin your testimony? Just saying, all right, Lord, what do you want to do through this? Maybe the neighbor who's out there having a bad day because they're picking up all the sticks and everything. You're out there singing, oh, how I love Jesus. They might take notice. That guy's picking up all these branches and everything, singing about how much he loves Jesus. Yeah, why? Because see, God, being good to me, didn't have to give me the house for the trees to be in so that the branches could fall over and I can come out and have my own yard to pick it up and put it in. Right? I had nothing, but he gave me everything that I have. What is that? That's the difference between embracing God's judgment and rebelling against God's judgment. But when we do obey and submit, the Son gets glory. And the Father is glorified through the Son. And He shows favor and He shows blessings on those that honor the name of His only begotten Son. Imagine how much different our life would be if instead of all the times that we denied the judgment of God in our life and grieved the Spirit of God in our life, if we would have embraced it, how much more pleased the Father would have been with the way that we lived our life. And as a result of it, others seeing the blessings of God in our life, our witness and our testimony would have been so much stronger. You know where it all stems from? All judgment's been committed under the Son. And either we agree with the Son, and by doing so give glory to Him, or we disagree and rebel against the Son and bring dishonor upon ourselves. That's it. Take a short break. Get ready for worship. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.